French Institute in uh, South Kent, uh, 10.30 uh, every Saturday morning. A couple of people here are regulars, so uh, we uh, can ask uh, details. And, uh, that's so that's for the commercial. Um, the, the theme, uh, persistence of an idea, um, is uh, something which uh, I, I have not read uh, the uh, Madsen issue, so I don't know exactly what is being said. Um, the question is really why ideas persist, or if you want to flip it the other side, why do, do they change? And uh, obviously there is a resistance to uh, changing ideas, and some societies uh, have made it a uh, part of what constitutes them that they uh, resist uh, any change, um, and typically because uh, of tradition, uh, because uh, their lifestyle is so well adapted to an environment and the society is so fragile that any change, any innovation is a threat to uh, the very fabric of the society and to the very fragile uh, dialogue uh, that it entertains with uh, the environment. Uh, first people, as Canadians call uh, that we used to call primitives, uh, are typically in that uh, situation. Uh, there is always a, uh, <coughs> a danger of any new ideas um, creating the sort of change that threatens the lifestyle, that threatens the uh, fabric, that threatens the identity of uh, these societies. And anthropologists and, uh, are so aware of this that uh, they even don't want to make contact with some of these societies because the mere contact with uh, uh, alien elements uh, could disturb uh, the, um, uh, the way that they, they operate and, and uh, alter their identity. In our societies, and especially since uh, the Renaissance, innovation is uh, a big fan. I mean, we, we put a big price, a big premium on uh, new ideas and um, therefore, we want to understand why certain ideas don't change, why they persist. And it's uh, true in things like science, it's true in things like uh, the arts, and many among you are architects, um, it's true in lifestyle. Uh, the uh, way that uh, we uh, accept uh, new ideas and challenge uh, tradition uh, has been very well described in uh, a, a book by uh, Thomas Kuhn, which has become the, uh, uh, I think the canonical uh, book on the subject uh, called uh, The uh, uh, Scientific uh, Revolution, I can't remember the title now, 1962, but <laughs> the, uh, uh, where he analyzed uh, how uh, scientific uh, theories um, change and where uh, sort of challenged by the people working at the margins of academia, the establishment, and, and so on. There, there is what he calls a paradigm, there is a dominant uh, way of looking at things. Um, with the theory, uh, the theory seems to be confirmed by experiments up until that moment when at the margin of uh, experiments in uh, very special situations, uh, young scholars, young uh, scientists say, hey, it doesn't work like that. You know, we can't reconcile what we observe with what the theory tells us. And professors, uh, people in the uh, sort of higher spheres of the scientific establishment would say, well, go back to you know, the study board, do the experiments again, it has to work uh, because we have done it and you should find the same results. And you know, more and more uh, experiments are made and more and more challenges are brought to the theory until such time when the uh, old professors retire and the new scholars become the new establishment and they uh, set the new paradigm and that becomes what is being taught and uh, what everybody has to apply until another uh, wave of uh, experiments that will show that you know the new paradigm is actually uh, not giving all the answers and it will change again. So 
the, uh, that, what, what, what we see here is the phenomenon um, of uh, competition and it's uh, the, the way that uh, our society is organized is around competition, competition between lifestyle, ideas, products, uh, ways of doing things, um, which is really a process of exploration. That is what competition is. I mean, it is a, a process of exploration, a process of discovery of uh, new things. In the world of humanities, you can have different theories that coexist. They may compete, but they coexist. There, there is room for everyone. And uh, you can see, for instance, in uh, the world of uh, uh, literary criticism, you have Marxism, which still has some uh, tenets. You have Freudism, which still has some uh, tenets. You have French theory. You have uh, various ideas that coexist. In science, it's more difficult because um, if one theory is correct, then the other one must not be. And uh, so it's very difficult, for instance, to have evolution and creationism working together, or to have a theory of, that's Thomas Kuhn's uh, example, theory of miasma, in other words, that you know, uh, uh, contagion, uh, spread of disease, and so on, is done in the air, and uh, until Pasteur and uh, Snow and others discovered microbes and germs and, and so on. So it's either one or uh, the other. In a lifestyle, of course, we have coexistence a certain uh, lifestyle. In architecture, um, what is interesting is that you seem to have different schools operating at the same time. I mean, functionalism, uh, where, of course, in architecture you need people who commission work. It's a bit like the film industry. Um, architecture requires big capital. It's not like painting a canvas or uh, composing something on a, uh, on a keyboard. Um, and you, so like films, producers say, well, this is what we are, we want to do. And the, the uh, people who will uh, commission a building will say, well, this is the sort of building that we want. And in the 1920s, uh, you know this better than I do. Um, architects said, well, yes, I mean, function should really be what governs uh, the design of, of a building. And that theory sort of continues uh, uh, upon you today. But it was, you know, East and, and, and all these people, Frank Lord, or Lord Wright, and, uh, and so on. But then you have a romantic idea where the artist says, well, hey, I'm the artist. And nobody tells me what I must do. And of course, the problem is, if nobody tells you what to do, then what you do is for nobody. So um, the, uh, in architecture, it's more difficult because you have to have a client who says, OK, but this is a big museum, or this is a tall building that uh, we want you to design. So um, go and do it. But this is what, what we want. And there is that conflict just from your uh, experience. And uh, so you have a minimalist school, uh, Tabea Ondo and uh, John Pawson and, and people like that, who coexist with uh, deconstructionist uh, people like Giri, one of my favorite architect, uh, architects, and um, uh, others, who, uh, Will Lideskin and people like this. And there isn't a paradigm there where People say, well, this is the architecture of today. Like, you know, we, we, we know what uh, the architecture of cathedrals is because they were all built more or less according to the same model. But what is the architecture of today? Where, where is the idea that persists and uh, has not sort of overtaken uh, all the rest? So it's interesting to see that in these fields, unlike in science, ideas sort of uh, uh, can coexist and uh, the, uh, the arts and humanities are probably the only domain where uh, you have this. That's all I have to say, very little in reality, but um, hopefully it makes sense. <laughs>